it is my enormous pleasure to present to you a beautiful family who's going to share some of their stories with us tonight, the leader of that clan, Mary Jane Clark, and her children, Jackson and Tonya. Mary Jane, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Thank you for asking me. Okay, I, I sat down with Mary Jane and uh, we got some of her photos. And so let's just sort of start from the beginning. And here's our first image right here. This is sort of the beginning down in Blanco. Well, this is my father's trading post in Blanco, New Mexico. And his partner was Mr. Burns from the Burns Bank here. Who in the Burns family were from Tierra Maria, New Mexico. But anyway, the man on the left is Ben V. Hill, and he lived in one of our houses. We had a, a whole acre, of, five acres of land with some extra houses on it. Anyway, he lived next door to us. The other people, and oh, the man in the middle is Doc Crager, the old man. He had had a stroke. So, and uh, he was he lived next door to the trading post with my great my great aunt was his housekeeper and uh, the others are customers you were born right there right yes in, in an adobe house and at that time the doctors made house calls and the doctor that came <laughs> can you imagine my the doctor that delivered me was dr salmons and you know there's a uh, well an archaeological uh, Salmon Ruins. The Salmon Ruins, which is down around Bloomfield, and that was <coughs> financed by the Salmon family. His wife owned the bank, and he delivered babies. All right, and <laughs> to show you what a beautiful baby it was, look at that right there. So this was, this was um, during a period of time when your father was, wasn't working at the trading post, and he started working for the gas company, is that right? Yes, Drilling a well? he, he went up to drill a well for the, uh, I think it was the Huntington Park Company. And uh, so we lived up there in a tent that had uh, wooden, wooden, wood on the sides and then the tent was on top. But, and uh, so my father worked there and uh, that's where I, I grew up for a couple of years. Right. Did you, what, would, what was your mom doing? Just taking care of you there? Or? No, she was cooking for all the men that worked on the uh, well, because there wasn't any place for them else to eat, you know. Can, can you t here's a picture that, that we found of you. Can you tell us a little bit about that picture and where it is? I think it's in front of the church <coughs> at Blanco. Oh, and at that time, the nuns taught in the public schools in, Blan in New Mexico. And uh, so, the nuns lived on one side of the ha of the church, and the priests lived on the other. And when the nuns were there in the, in the winter, the priests ate with them. But when uh, they they left and went to the mother house or something in the summer, and the, so the priest ate all of his meals with us. And here's a photo of the church, folks. <coughs> Isn't that a beautiful old building? That's not there anymore, is it? That's called St. Rose of Lima Church. Oh, it is. Uh-huh. Okay. And I think it's when about I, the only building left um, in Blanco besides my mother's house, which is right next door. Okay. You know, one thing I noticed when I was scanning this, I don't know if you folks can see well enough on the screen here, but can you look right there? Remember when I showed you this the other day, Mary Jane? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There was a face in There's the... There's a face in the steeple there. Can you guys see that? And we don't know whether that's a double exposure on an old camera. I mean, when, about when was this photo taken? I won't hold it against you. <laughs> I'm being real diplomatic here. <laughs> it's Our Lady of the Church. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> but it might also probably. be a spirit, but we, do you, we, we looked at it very carefully. We had no idea who that person uh -uh. is, did we? No. So it's a mystery of Blanco, New Mexico. <laughs> Let's go to the next photo you gave me here. Who are those people? So that's my mother's aunt, a great aunt, who was her mentor and probably the um, most influential person in her life, and the, then the one on the right, the one on the far left, the far left was Auntie. We called her Auntie, and then my mother's sister, Dawn, and then my mom, and then the woman on the right, as you look at the photograph, is my our grandmother, my mother's mother, and her name name was Grace. And didn't you tell me you learned how to drive driving that car? Isn't that the car you learned yes, how to drive? Yes, it was a Model A. Uh huh. Auntie taught me how to drive. 
Was she a good driver? Yes, excellent. <laughs> so, so, so tell me, uh, you said that, that your aunt was your mentor, someone yes. you really looked up to, why is that? Well, she came out to New Mexico and, and she uh, uh, was a housekeeper for Mr. Crager. You saw his picture in, those, in that first picture. Anyway, uh, and he thought it was a good idea. She, at that time, there was a lot of tuberculosis and my, my father came out for tuberculosis and stayed with Auntie in that house and she had other people that stayed there and the main thing was to have a, a screen porch for them to sleep in and they either got well or they died and it was the, all the fresh dry air that cured them you know wow. so she was quite a, a person she took care of the people she did their laundry she fed them and and uh, s some got well was that an inspiration for your your career later on well, probably. Okay, well, we'll talk about it, but first you've got to tell us about this. This is not Annie Oakley, this is Mary Jane Clark. This is in um, the hunting pictures. Oh, well, I went, I went to college in Omaha and Nebraska, and uh, that's Jimmy McCarthy, whose sister was a friend of mine in college, and uh, I went home with her for Christmas because the war was on I couldn't get home so they invited me to stay with them but anyway uh, that we went pheasant hunting in Nebraska and I've never seen so many pheasants were, were you a pretty good shot uh-huh my okay. father used to teach us how to shoot okay. he taught my kids too okay oh this is special this is why I asked maybe you know your inspiration tell us about this well that's my graduation from nurses training in Mercy Hospital and uh, that was, uh, the war was almost over at that time. And, uh, well, it was over. It was over in August, and we graduated the following spring. So. W weren't you in the Army Nurse Corps? Or? Well, they needed nurses during the war, so it was a, Army, a Nurse Cadet Corps. And I think we were paid $15 the first six months, and then 20, and then 30 the last year. Well, that's a pretty good raise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> okay. And I think we got some more here. That to, to tell, isn't that Auctioner Hospital? What can you tell us about the old Auctioner Hospital? Well, I just think Dr. Auctioner was something, you know. He was a great photographer. This is his. And he, he won awards from the New York area He when he uh, would enter a... a some of his we got some of his pictures. photos but I wanted to show you folks I don't know how many years later this is but there's Mary Jane um, just a two days ago on the steps of what's now the Gable House but it was the auctioneer hospital and so back up just a little bit and talk about how did you end up in Durango and how did you end up working at the different hospitals well after I graduated from Mercy in Denver and I came back here uh, there at that time there wasn't intensive care for patient, patients that were really sick, you know. So they had private duty nurses and you could, you would work eight hours and you would either go to the home or the hospital or wherever they were and take care of them. Just one, you would have one patient to take care of for eight hours. And I did a lot of that. And some of it was at uh, Oshner Hospital for Dr. Oshner's patients. Will you tell these folks how this photo relates to Dr. Oshner in the hospital? <laughs> the dead rabbit. Dr. Oshner and his wife and his niece and a bunch of dead rabbits. <laughs> well, he was a good shot. <laughs> <laughs> and he also had a... His house is on 4th Avenue and 7th Street. But anyway, he had a shooting gallery in, his, in the basement. And... Uh, that's where he practiced his shooting. And frankly, um, he used to kill the deer when they came off the big island at Electra Lake. And uh, that's why no one shoots on, on the big island anymore. But that's how he fed the hospital. You know, he was a great shot and a great photographer and a great doctor. So, so he fed these rabbits to the patients, right? Mm -hmm. Right, okay, see? It's called... Woods to table. It's the, 
It's the precursor to farm to table. How, how, did, how did he end up starting his hospital? Well, he worked at Mercy, and uh, the story was that he uh, would go around to different patients and tell them their doctor wasn't taking very good care of them. <laughs> so they all kicked him out, literally. And so he, he started his own hospital, and that, the first one was over on West Park. And it wasn't big enough, so then he he got this one, and he was a cousin of the doctor Oshner in New Orleans, who has a clinic there, and he was a very capable doctor. He delivered both of us. No, no, we were born in his hospital. Yes, uh huh. You were? Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. that's pretty amazing. This is a doctor Oshner photo that Mary Jane gave me, but you know, in addition to all the hunting shots, you know, he had sort of another specialty, didn't he? Well, in terms he, of photography, mm -hmm. like this one over your shoulder yeah. here. He could do anything, really. Yeah, he um, enjoyed the human figure, <laughs> especially well, lady why humans. Not? <laughs> he took good you know, care I, of it. So how did how did these women in that day and age end up, um, you know, agreeing to be photographed nude? Um, and then where was that photograph? Where where is that wa waterfall you were telling well, us? Well, this is a, va a waterfall up the valley. So that's at Zinc's Waterfall Ranch, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. You know, Jack, one time I was at the, this house, these people were having a, a garage sale, and they had a bunch of the nude photographs of Dr. Oshner's, and all of these older women were going through them and giggling and laughing, and I came up and I said, are these Dr. Oshner's? And they said, no, they're us. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> Thank God there was no Facebook back then, right? Okay. Oh, they, were, they were probably flattered. Hey, you know what? It's a. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay, and so that's. What's that? Mercy Hospital, the early Mercy Hospital. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the way it was when I was in tr nurses training okay. there. Okay, and then it expanded a bit, like this. Quite a bit. Okay, and something really for those of you who, how many of you here remember the old Mercy Hospital? One thing int interesting about this photograph, see the cross up there um, on top of the building? Well, that cross is in front of the St. Columbus School now when they tore down the hospital. So if you're ever going by that and you see it, now you're going to know where that came from. But it was a gift to the to, the, to St. Columba. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Oh, you know that guy. That's Dr. Lloyd. Oh, of course. You want to talk about him a little? Well, I, uh, he was, when he first came here, uh, he... He and Dr. Martin had, and that's before I was here, they uh, had the, the building that Dr. Oshner has. But anyway, then they went off to war. And then when they came back, they went to Mercy to work. And uh, I didn't, I don't think Dr. War, I never knew a Dr. Martin, but Dr. Lloyd was really special. He, he was. And How his son is here tonight. That's right. Where's Leo? There he is, right there. Yeah. Thank you, Leo, for coming. Yeah. How'd you end up working for Dr. Lloyd? Well, he was in the Burns Bank upstairs. That, now that's uh, the Irish pub, and his office was upstairs, and he needed a nurse, so he asked me if I'd work for him. Then I worked for him when he was in the Graydon building, too. Oh, you got to tell a story about this place. So this is the Perkins house. And my mom, I put this photograph in here because my mom knew Zadie Perkins and um, has a great story to tell about her father and how she entered the world. Well, Zadie Perkins was born in Silverton. And she, her father was Mr. Rockwood. And uh, his wife died in childbirth, so Mr. Rock, the youths were threatening to burn Silverton at that time. So he put Zadie in a, a saddlebag and rode over the hill to Lake City, and he found a wet nurse for her. Then he came back to fight the youths, but the, the wind had changed, so that kind of ended that. Anyway, Zadie grew up, and that, that ended up being her home. Incidentally, Mr. Rockwood, uh, I, and I don't know exactly what his background was. I'm trying to find out. Uh, but Rockwood was named after him, and he also owned Edgemont Ranch. And uh, that's the house that his daughter, Zadie, who'd been in Saddlebag, 
was uh, living in when she, when I knew her, and she and Mary Pingree were kind of the grand doms of Durango. And Mary Pingree's father had been uh, uh, General Sherman, no, General Graham in the, in the Confederate Army. He went to West Point with Sherman, and when Sherman came uh, through the South, he, he told his troops not to touch uh, General Graham's plantation, which I understand is around Baton Rouge. Anyway, then General uh, Graham came here and started the Graham Hardware, and Mary Pingree was his daughter. Wow. And th this house is right next to Hood Mortuary, if you're wandering in, around town and you want to find some of these places. <laughs> well, and the mortuary was Mary Pingree's home. Okay. It was before, the, and and so she and Zadie Perkins were really good friends. Now, was it a mortuary at the time? No. Oh, okay. It was her home, and they had open house every Sunday. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a lot more fun to live there <laughs> <laughs> under those circumstances. <laughs> okay, let's see what else we got here, Mary Jane. This is pre-purgatory. Why don't you tell them about this? Oh, well, we used to go to Hesper's to ski, uh-huh. And uh, is that Hesper's too? And then that, I think, and then we used to ski off of Cold Bank Pass. Um, we were, there was a Mill, Millwood. Mill Creek. Mill, Mill Creek, Creek Lodge. Yes, uh-huh. And we'd, we'd go up to the top and ski down. And then Ray Duncan started Purgatory, and we skied Purgatory before it was opened one, with Chet Wigton one time and then to see how it was going to be and then they finally got it going yeah so this is the opening day at purgatory this picture is just a little dim but that's governor uh love right mm -hmm. john love john love up on the balcony of the old purgies and that's the opening day photo and my family was there too we had a lot of fun at that my memory of opening day was that they made us ride the lift all the way up and all the way back for us to practice riding <laughs> <laughs> I remember we couldn't figure out why there wasn't a seat belt on it. I'd never been off the ground before. But anyway, so, well, I want, this is my favorite, I think, right here. This is, this is you and you skiing, Mary Jane. Well, it was so wonderful, wasn't it? Jackson, tell me what about, about a time skiing with your mom that you remember. You know, there are a lot of, I, the best one I want her to tell is the time she decided to take us to Monarch uh, with Joe Peters. Tell, <laughs> tell him that story. Well, this Joe. This is pre purgatory. Pre purgatory. Well, I was taking classes at Fort Lewis College, and Joe Peters was in, in my class, and so he uh, was a skier. And so, was that, that was the time we decided to go to Monarch to ski. But the, we got to South Fork, and the Mercedes blew up. So. <laughs> Well, so anyway, we uh, got into a garage, thank goodness, and rented another car and went back up to uh, uh, Wolf Creek Pass and skied all day. Was a ski area there, or did, was there was there actually a ski area there? Uh huh. Oh, okay, I didn't On know. Top I, didn't, of Wolf I wasn't Creek. sure when it was. But and what, what I remember about that is that she called my father. <laughs> there was no cell phones, of course, and, and the cars broken down in South Fork, so. He was getting ready to watch the New York Giants and the Cleveland Browns. And he was not real happy, but he got in his car. And he drove all the way over to South Fork to pick us up, only to find out my mom had decided to rent a car and take a ski in a Wolf Creek. <laughs> That's a sign of a real skier. <laughs> well, all he said was, I wish you hadn't called me. <laughs> <laughs> OK. This is some old Fiesta photos. That's just the parade, and so is this. That's just the parade. Well, oh. you had a friend that raced in the Fiesta races, right? At the at the at the fairgrounds yeah. used to be a used to have a racetrack. Uh huh. Great. And uh, a man, one of the uh, fellows I knew from Blanco, Paul Hackus, was a jockey, so he would tell me which horse was going to win. And okay. <laughs> that, that was really nice. <laughs> That's not illegal, is it? I don't think Insider so. Insider trading. <laughs> Okay, what else we got here? Oh, tell me, tell me where that came from. What's That's this That's the one? chief. It's a chief. Well, there's all that fuss about it, and it's so silly. 
And Antonia asked one of the Indians the other day who was in the gallery what he thought about and he said, well, uh, he's smiling and he's waving. Is there something wrong with that? <laughs> okay. So, well, tell us just one little bit. I don't know how many people here remember the actual chief diner itself. Just tell us a little bit about what that was like. Well, it was it was a railroad car, right. a large one. A, a, right it at the bottom of 22nd Street. And it was a, I, don't, I think it was a, a standard gauge that they had made a, a restaurant out of. We have a picture of it in the gallery. And anyway, the chief was right there, and his, the only thing about him that was different is his arm moved up and down. We don't do that. <laughs> anyway, and two, a lot of the uh, natives that come in that have heard of, if we talk to them about the chief, they said they used to go there for the hamburgers with their parents, you know. So it was uh, really a nice place until it closed. And then when we bought the chief. I don't know if we knew what we were going to do with it, but it's worked out fine on our parking lot. Well, I think you've repurposed it very well. Got a and couple of Electro Lake stories. You want to talk about some of your favorite things to do at Electro Lake? Oh, I think Electro Lake is just wonderful. It's so just so pleasant to be there and and uh, we're so lucky to have that and anyone can go up if they want to you know and the restaurant's very good this year and they just opened so that's great too well tell us about that story actually Antonio you tell us about that picture well, on so the that picture on the far left is me that's me in the front of the boat and my mom at the um, wheel of the 10 horsepower, probably five horsepower motor at the time. And my mother was a, a compulsive fisherman. She would get up at five o'clock in the morning and go fishing with people like um, um, Tommy Hatfield and Mr. Chapman, who Chapman Hill is named after. And then he, she'd come in at like seven in the morning with fresh fish for breakfast for us, which was great. But she always timed our naps for her favorite fishing time. So, so what's going on here is that we are headed up to fairyland, um, which my mother used to tell me if I was really quiet, the fairies would come out of the, out of the <laughs> rocks. And uh, my brother and I would take our naps in the, in the bottom of the boat while my mother fished. Um, and that just kind of became <coughs> what we did, you know? And, and that um, mahogany boat there, that is, the Antonia, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why that boat is named the Antonia is because my grandfather had a Century Sea made mahogany boat and it was already named the Mary Jane. <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't have that name. <laughs> so it's named the Antonia. Well, it's nice your boat is down at the railroad it museum. Is. It's at it the really railroad is. museum and we're very proud to share that with everybody. It was on Electro Lake for 80 years. 1939 Century Sea Maid. That, that was a gift from my dad to the uh, to the museum. What else we got here? Well, there you go. Is that Jackie Onassis? Oh no, that's you. And my mother was a great sport about always driving the boat for us when we were growing up, and and she slalom skied too, and we we just you know it was like it just this wonderful period of our lives. But she was always so willing to, to pull us behind the ski boat or do whatever, you know. But the, <clears throat> the problem was you know, they passed a rule at the lake that you had to have an observer, <laughs> somebody to watch the, um, the skier while the driver was, was there. So if there was only one person there who wanted to go skiing, what she would do is get our dog, Tramp, and put him in the front seat and tie a <laughs> bandana around his <laughs> neck so it somehow would confuse the caretaker and think he was... A, <laughs> and she's not a rule follower. <laughs> and we, we, it was so much fun. I know Buzzy's here, some other folks. That when Bobby Duthie, a lot of us grew up around, in and around Electro Lake. And, you know, back in those days, there was no cell phones. In fact, there was a, like a party line up at Electro Lake or even just one phone. And we'd spend the whole summer up there. And it was an amazing way to grow up, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. it was amazing. And there was just one phone, and you'd go down and stand in line to use it, remember? Uh, I, in I the do. clubhouse. Yeah, we were standing <laughs> in line, and I remember we got the party phones, and the coolest part was like listening in on other people's conversation. <laughs> remember that part? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Okay, let's see what else you got here. Well, I just want to tell you, Mary Jane, that you are a beautiful woman and you're also very attractive in these pictures, but I'm so proud to be up on this stage with you and to share these stories with our our folks here tonight and especially your your beautiful son and daughter here as well. Can you tell them about the blanket? Oh, well, this is a chief's blanket and uh, it's it's uh, it's a copy of a chief's blanket. The real chief's blanket are, are uh, really costly now, but Jackson had these woven so he could sh show people what they really were. Do you want to tell answer that more? We would just um, it's, it's expensive to own real blankets, and so when we would do talks to um, educate people about the history of Navajo weaving, we decided to have the same wools and the same dyes used by a couple of weavers that put together some beautiful blankets. Um, Bertha Harvey is, is the weaver. She's done these now for about five years, but terrific artist. When did you start the gallery? Oh, well, we had the Pepsi-Cola company here and the franchise was a reservation. And so the traders would pay us in rugs and jewelry and uh, because they really were, didn't have a big market for selling them. Anyway, so we had a showroom at the bottling company and, and my Antonio and Jackson, all of us had been involved in that kind of thing in a trading post anyway. So we always had a showroom at the bottling company and then we sold the bottling company to a Mr. Polad who owned the St. Paul Twins, and he didn't want the Indian jewelry or any of the Indian business. So we bought the building that we're in now, and that's worked out very well. I have to say that I think all of us are very impressed here. Are you, are you folks glad you got to share this evening with? Well, thank you. Okay. 